Hello, today I'm going to be reviewing House Made of Dawn by N. Scott Mamaday. Um, this actually is the winner of the Pulitzer Prize, and he was the first Native American author to win the Pulitzer Prize. Um, this essentially is the story of a young Native American man named Abel, and it's kind of a story of someone grappling with their identity again. Um, read this for a class, and I, at first, I'm gonna be honest, okay, this was my experience, and I told my mom, and I was about halfway through, I go, yeah, okay, like, it's not bad, it's not poorly written, and I get, kind of, like, I get the idea behind why we were reading it, but why this book? Why not pick a different book? But then by the end, I ended up really, really enjoying it, and getting a lot out of it, and I think that's why I just wasn't patient enough um, so, I suggest reading this. It's not super long. I think it's only 186 pages long. Something like that. 182 pages? Yeah, ridiculous. Uh, 186. But yeah, it's super short. So, if you're gonna read it, just be prepared that you're gonna have to read towards the end. If you're not, if it's just kinda like, okay, like, alright, it's okay. It went from being like a solidly three-star novel to almost a five-star Almost. I think I might have given it. I think I gave it four, but I might have given it five. It was right there on the borderline. Um, but it the the story is never told from Abel's perspective, which is super interesting. It's told from four different people's perspective. You have Angela, who's a woman that um, Abel has kind of like a relationship with for a minute. Um, you have his friend Ben. You have the sun priest Tusama, and then you have Father Olguin who is the like priest up for the town that Abel grew up in on a reservation. And the key figures really are the Sun Priest plays has a big part and one of my favorite parts. Um, then you also have Abel obviously and his grandfather Francisco who raises him and who's kind of like this figure of the native culture of Abel's ancestors. Um, you have like a history of Francisco and and you have Abel kind of trying to come of age he uh, goes to World War Two, I think. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So, like, World War Two, he goes and he fights, and then he comes back, and he's kind of a drunk, and he, he lives in L.A. for a while, and he's kind of fighting to reconcile uh, living in this, like, white American world with the traditions and legacy and legends of his of his people. Um, very, very well-written book. It's kind of almost Faulkner-esque, and not so much the way that, uh, some of it is a little unhinged, but it's because the, you get, you, in the same way in The Sound and the Fury that Faulkner is really talking about Caddy, um, the whole story, but you never get her perspective. Her voice doesn't exist. You literally get everyone else's perspective about her is the same way that this novel functions about Abel. The story is about Abel, but you never get his perspective. You get everyone else talking about Abel. And what's potentially significant about that is that it you're taking away Abel's voice. He is voiceless because he's in a position, he's in a cultural bind, kind of. Um, anyway, it's super interesting. Um, I don't want to spoil anything because it's kind of hard because so many things loop back on themselves. But the the writing is very descriptive, especially when it comes to like the the ge ge ugh, geography. Um, it's really beautiful where he's describing like the mesas and all the different things without being overly um, you know dedicated to scenery. It's a really really good novel. I highly suggest going and checking this out. But I do I do warn you that if you if you want to check this out. Be prepared to just read the whole thing. Like, don't stop halfway through. It really does pay off towards the end. Um, now, let's see if I can find one of my good... Okay, yeah, okay. Where do I want to start this? This might be a long reading. Yeah, okay. So this one's going to be long, but just settle in and uh, or leave. But I appreciate you watching. Um, okay. And this is from the Sun Priest section. In the beginning was the Word. 
and I have taken as my text this evening the Almighty Word itself. Now get this. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Amen, brothers and sisters, amen. And the riddle of the word, in the beginning was the word. And now what do you suppose old John meant by that? That cat was a preacher. And well, you know how it is with preachers. He had something big on his mind. Oh my, it was big. It was the truth. And it was heavy. And old John hurried to set it down. And in his hurry, he said too much. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It was the truth, all right, but it was more than the truth. The truth was overgrown with fat, and the fat was God. The fat was John's God, and God stood between John and the truth. Old John, see, he got up one morning and caught sight of the truth. It must have been like a bolt of lightning, and the sight of it made him blind. And for a moment, the vision burned on in the back of his eyes, and he knew what it was. And in that instance, he saw something he never seen before, and would never see again. That was the instant of revelation, inspiration, truth. And old John, he must have fallen down on his knees. Man, he must have been shaking and laughing, and crying and yelling and praying, all at the same time, and he must have been drunk and delirious with the truth. You see, he had lived all his life waiting for that one moment, and it came, and it took him by surprise, and it was gone. And he said, in the beginning was the word. And man, right then and there, he should have stopped. There was nothing more to say, but he went on. He said all there was to say, everything, but he went on. In the beginning was the word. Brothers and sisters, that was the truth. The whole of it. The essential and eternal truth. The bone and blood and muscle of the truth. But he went on, old John, because he was a preacher. The perfect vision faded from his mind and he went on. The instant passed, and then he had nothing but a memory. He was desperate and confused, and in his confusion he stumbled and went on. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He went on to talk about Jews and Jerusalem, Levites and Pharisees, Moses and Philip and Andrew and Peter. Don't you see? Old John had to go on. That cat had a whole lot at stake. He couldn't let the truth alone. He couldn't see that he had come to the end of the truth, and he went on. He tried to make it bigger and better than it was, but instead he only demeaned and encumbered it. He made it soft and big with fat. He was a preacher, and he made a complex sentence of the truth. Two sentences, three, a paragraph. He made a sermon and a theology of the truth. He imposed his idea of God upon the everlasting truth. In the beginning was the word, and that is all there was, and it was enough. Now, brothers and sisters, old John was a white man. And the white man has his ways. Oh, gracious me, he has his ways. He talks about the word. He talks through it and around it. He builds upon it with syllables, with prefixes and suffixes and hyphens and accents. He adds and divides and multiplies the word. And in all of this, he subtracts the truth. And brothers and sisters, you have come here to live in the white man's world. Now the white man deals in words, and he deals easily, with grace and sleight of hand. And in his presence, here on his own ground, you are as children mere babes in the woods. You must not mind, for in this you have a certain advantage. A child can listen and learn. The world is sacred to a child. So I appreciate it if you stuck by through all that, and I'll let you go. As always, have a good life and happy reading.